Welcome to your intended message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who can help you communicate more effectively, whether that's one-to-one, one-to-few, or one-to-many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one to self. I'm your host, George Tora. My guest today is John Watkiss. Here's three facts that I think you should know about John. One, he is currently the president of the Central Florida chapter of the National Speakers Association. Two, he is the first Canadian-born actor to play Mufasa in, in the Disney musical, The Lion King. And three, his Sunday ritual is making and eating decadent, delicious pancakes. John Watkiss, welcome to your intended message. George, thank you so much. It's, it's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. It's wonderful to talk with you in Central Florida, and just thinking about those pancakes makes me hungry already. John, you are a, a, a public speaker, um, a musician, a performer. You performed in Lion King, and I believe that you pointed out that there are there are lessons and techniques that public speakers can take from singing, from music. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be able to sing or play an instrument. It's just that you can take some of the same principles, apply them to speaking, and you'll get some good results. So give us an example of one or two of those principles that we can take from music. Well, let's take the most important part of a song. It's the chorus. We all know that when you hear a song, that chorus is repeated over and over, and it's the central part of the song. It's the reason you're actually singing the song. Now, if you were to take this to a presentation, how many times have you sat in an audience and after five, 10, 15 minutes thought to yourself, where on earth is this going? Why? No chorus. <laughs> There's no actual intended reasoning, or at least none has been explained, for why that person is speaking. You never listen to a song and go, what's the song about? Okay, maybe some, like, da, da, da. Yeah, we don't know what that was. <laughs> we don't know what that was about. That was, <laughs> that was the chorus, right? So sure, we have some songs like that, but rarely are they hits. It's the same with a speech. There's got to be a chorus, a main message for why you're saying what you're saying. And as with a song, it should be repeated over and over. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're saying the same word over and over, but the core of the message is there. So that would be the first one that I would mention is that chorus you need to have. So at the end of it, people can say, this is what it was about. Because I've left and I'm sure you have many times asking yourself, why did I just spend 30 minutes to an hour listening to that person speak? And I suppose that you mention it, um, some people are, well, some speakers simply don't clarify their message and some are reluctant to repeat the message because they think they're doing something wrong. And, and the reality is we need to hear the message and not necessarily in the same words, but we need to hear it more than once before we sink in. Uh, and, and I guess the, a good example of that, imagine if, if you're trying to rehearse or if you're trying to memorize, whether it's a, a speech, a poem, a song, you say it over and over again so that you own it. And when the speaker, they need to say the message more than one time. And, and I suppose um, one of the best, I think, one of the best examples of, of someone who repeated their message in their speech was Martin Luther King in his favorite, in his famous speech, I Have a Dream. And we all remember those words. We probably don't remember the rest, but we remember those words because he said it 11 times. 
And never once did he apologize for repeating himself. So the chorus is, is about repeating the message and people need to do that. So um, thank you for pointing that out. What's another principle from music that we can take to public speaking? You know, to build, George, just on one more thing that you mentioned there in terms of the repetition and why it's so important. You know, when we read a book, we can go back if we didn't get what the speaker said and we didn't understand it. But when we're listening, it's a very different dynamic. And so if we can't go back and repeat for the listener what was said, they forget it. So this is why, as you said, people apologize for saying the same thing over and over, thinking the audience is going to remember those key words. They do not. And so that's why that becomes so important. A second part, if we talk about music, and a lot of times this gets left in the background, is mood. I tell people, everyone owns a song. And what I mean by that is, you can be in a conversation, you're out at the mall, you're talking with someone, and all of a sudden, you hear something that stops the conversation. You go, Shh, that's my song. <laughs> Why? Because of the way it makes you feel. And you don't have to hear the whole song. All you have to hear are the very beginning notes. And you remember and you get that feeling of nostalgia. It brings you back somewhere. Well, in a speech, we also want to set the mood. And just like we do with a song, do it right at the beginning. What is the mood that the audience is going to be in when you begin speaking? And then what mood do you want to move them into within your speech? You've got to set that tone right off the bat. And so again, it's an element that we often forget about and don't even realize needs to be there. But how does the speech make you feel? Outside of statistics and, and facts and examples, there should be an emotional connection because when we're actually moved, it's because of the way we feel. We know we should exercise. We know we should eat right. But if we don't feel like it, then it doesn't happen. So this is important in a speech as well. Create the mood right at the beginning so that people are in the place where you need them to be to receive the message. And, and John, as you're saying that, it, it resonated with me. And yet so many speakers start their, their speech with just something, uh, uh, something vague, you know, hello, everybody, I'm happy to be here today. I'm going to talk about and here's the agenda. None of that sets mood. What kind of what kind of opening lines can help set the mood? So George, here's, here's what I have found over time is that it depends on the actual scenario and the people. And let me go to a scenario that every speaker is familiar with or becomes familiar with, and no one warns them about it. I'm not sure why. It is during the conference, you're speaking the morning after the last night where they've had that party. <laughs> you, you know the one. Everybody has been drinking <laughs> and they're, you're lucky that they're actually going to make it to the room <laughs> that morning. So your intended message can get lost <laughs> because you maybe come out and explode out of the blocks, not realizing that you have a hungover audience. So that is a different approach than you might have to an audience that is there to celebrate for an award ceremony, but they haven't had the last night of drinking yet. So you can really approach this from a number of different angles, depending on what is, we go back to that mood. What's the mood at the start? What mood do you want them to be in? I can start with a question, one that is for entry. And I might say, true or false, our attention spans are getting shorter. And I'll have the audience being prepared to answer. And before I let them answer, say, okay, well, think about this. Imagine a teenager who is playing a video game that they enjoy. Are they having trouble paying attention? Get the entry going. No, now think about people watching their favorite sport. It's a championship game. They're down to the last few minutes. Is anybody having trouble paying attention? And, oh, great. So guess what? It's not attention that's the problem, it's interest. So as a speaker, how do you keep the interest 
of your audience despite all the distractions that are happening. So I've asked them enough questions to get them interested in what we're going to say next. And, and that I find um, insightful, John, because people seem to think that, oh, it's attention spans that we have to deal with, but really it's interest. And, and so how do, we, how do we gain, how do we keep their interest? This is, this is where we appeal to them. As you, you notice, when I started asking those questions, this was curiosity. Oh, wait a second. I've never thought of it that way. I've given you a different perspective now. So I'm drawing you in with a little bit of curiosity and making you think, wow, I've never thought of it that way. And that opens you up to hearing a little bit more of what you want to say. It gives you authority as well. Now, you could do that with a quotation. For example, you could say, we've all heard that knowledge is power. But is it really? Does just knowing something make you powerful? For example, we know a treadmill is not meant for hanging clothes on it, but is it not what we do? So it's not the knowledge, it's the application of the knowledge that gives us power. Now, again, what I've done is I've given myself some credibility because I've taken common knowledge and I've contradicted it and people want to lean in a little bit more. Well, what else does John have to say? And that way, the intended message can get across when I hook them right at the beginning. Now, John, I'm intrigued by that, that phrase, I've never thought of it that way. And perhaps it would be a good test for any speaker. It is, is that the way the audience is going to react? If you're simply repeating what they already know, or if you're repeating cliches or overused quotations, and they're thinking, yeah, 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 I heard it before. What you really want them to do is go, oh, I never thought of it that way, which means that you as the speaker first need to think of it differently. You hit the, the nail on the head, George. When we, when we think differently, when we go in the opposite direction and stop saying what we've heard so many times before, all of a sudden we've got a different level of credibility and a reason for the audience to tune in. Again, just like music, you've given them that little hook that beat was good. The opening lyrics got you, got your attention. I think of my song, one of my favorite openings, Oh Sherry, I should have been gone. No, and now <laughs> you just hear the opening, you're like, oh, okay, I gotta get some more now. So it's a little bits and pieces that just draw you in. And saying what's contrary to popular belief is one of the best ways to do that. And and I suppose now, similar to music, it's it's those those riffs, those 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 those, those rhythms that 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 catch us differently, that that you know, they grab our attention, and and we all have our individual likes, but it's it's the differences that grab our attention. It's not just uh, it's not just the old elevator music. And, and I suppose the message there for presenters and speakers is don't give an elevator music speech. <laughs> yeah, you, you nailed it on the head. In fact, you also now just touched on another element in music that's also in the speeches, and that's the rhythm. Because we keep hearing people say, say it in a few words, keep it short. Well, think about the most we talked about Dr. Dr. King's speech, I Have a Dream. If you go back to his most popular line, it wasn't short. I have a dream that one day my four children will grow up in a world where they should not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Whew, that's not a short phrase, <laughs> yet it resonates with us. So it's not about the length. It is about just how relevant that message is. And when you change up the, the, the rhythm of it, in other words, short words, long words, monosyllabic words, and then multisyllabic words, short sentences and long sentences, then you don't get lulled into just hearing the same thing every time. And that's where rhythm works for us so that it's nice for the ear. And that's the difference between writing for the ear versus writing for the eye. 
the I, when you read the book, it doesn't sound natural in that if you were to say it out loud, it doesn't sound like someone speaking. And so when you write your, for the ear, when you prepare your speeches, you have to say it to say, just ask yourself, how does that sound? Just like a musician would. They play the note, they write it down, then they revise it and say, oh, what would be different? There's always that revision going on based on how it sounds. Now, John, I'm going to go back to a point you made earlier about setting the mood at the beginning. I'm curious about your experience with performing in The Lion King. What's the mood at the beginning? What's the mood and how, how do we set it? The mood in that sense was always anticipation. You think about it, it's, it's dark. The, they know what to expect, so the audience is absolutely excited. And then the shout goes out, and then it begins to swell from there with both the, the crescendo of the music and then the lights and sound. For a presentation, I like to have that same approach. Not that I don't start strong because the opening of that show starts strong, but I don't start at my strong gist. In other words, I have to find an opportunity to swell, to get bigger. I remember when I was in, I was singing a song. I can't even remember the song. It was Let's Begin Again. And believe it or not, back then I hadn't found my chest voice. So I was singing in falsetto and I belted that song out. And at the end of it, my teacher said to me, you sang that song so strong from the beginning that you had nowhere to go. You had already hit your highest point. So when I'm starting, yes, I want to start powerfully enough that I attract attention, but then I want to give my ability to swell and grow so that by the time I get to the end, you hit that bridge or that crescendo where now you've hit the apex of it, as opposed to hitting it right at the beginning. You tire people out if you keep them there. So that beginning for me has got to be powerful enough to draw them in, create interest, have them trust that I'm about to take them on a journey, but then grow and expand. The song has got to get better as it goes along. Now, the interesting point there is don't start at your strongest. Start moderately strong, strong enough to grab attention, but leave room because you still need to take the audience on a journey. Absolutely, yes. And, and that's the big mistake you see a lot of motivational speakers make is they, they just start out and it's, it's up there and they're walking fast and they're talking fast and whew, you get, in fact, it's, I can't hear you. How are you doing today? And that's the beginning. Where do you go from there? <laughs> you gotta give yourself some room. Yeah, and you're right. And, and now that you mention it, yes, I've seen too many of those motivational wannabe speakers who start off, how is everybody today? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. And and that's the beginning. And where do you go from there? And, and you just wore everybody out and everything else is going to be a low from there. Plus a little, you know, a little phoniness there too, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, it is. And you know what? A lot of people don't like that. They do. Look, I just said good morning. Why are you asking me to say it again? <laughs> so now, yes, you need somewhere to go. Now, John, when it comes to music, um, in, in, and I know we all have our own favorites, what music gives you, what music gets you ready for your presentation? Wow. Wow. Uh, I, I really do scales, believe it or not. And I still, to this day, do scales that we did during the Lion King. So I'm, I'm doing, Hingonyama, 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 till I get down to the bottom of my range. So I'm doing, as you heard me do when you asked for just a sound check, I do tongue twisters. So my music is really just the vocal warm-ups because my voice is an instrument. Our voices are instruments. So I like singing to myself. 
I can't do too much because I'm I'm one of those emotional people. Music just it it gets me emotional. So you play uh, "This Is Me" from the Greatest Showman on Earth. It's like okay, I'm I'm too happy now. So, <laughs> but I do love those songs that get me excited more than anything else. Now, John, I, I'm I'm glad you bring it up because be, before we started, you you did some tongue twisters. Uh, just to get just to get your your mouth lips and, and tongue in, in order and and I wonder how many speakers actually do little warm-ups and, and it's curious that you mentioned scales because uh, whatever instrument or or voice you're playing you don't necessarily perform scales in in concert or on stage but you need to do the scales to build to build the habits to build to build the skills to build the strength and too many presenters do not build they don't do scales they don't do little rehearsals they don't do tongue twisters and just for the audience and because you did it so well when i tried to uh, follow you i i I, stumbled, I tripped over my tongue just give us a few of those tongue twisters that people might might adopt as their own before they they get on get on camera or get on stage or get on a phone call sure we'll do so i'll say rubber baby buggy bumper rubber baby buggy bumper toy boat toy boat Toy boat, toy boat. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? I'll go through that in, entire realm and get all the different muscles working. And as you said, no, we're not doing it on stage, but these are muscles. And the only way to prepare the muscle is to exercise it when we're not doing the actual activity. So you're right, when a sprinter goes onto the track, they don't do all of those little things that you'll see them do in practice, but it's the practice behind the scenes that gets you prepared to perform at your best. And singers know this. That's why singers will do the scales. And so I'm just taking the exact same principle because, and I'm not sure if you've seen this, there are, there are singers who don't warm up. And as a result, they get what are called nodules on their voice and they have to get them removed surgically and then can't sing for a while. So you can abuse your voice by not preparing it the right way. Mm. Powerful lessons. And, and yeah, I'd rubber baby uh, buggy, buggy bumpers. Bumper. Rubber, <laughs> rubber baby rubber baby buggy bumper <laughs> buggy bumper <laughs> buggy bumpers yes that good one and, and toy boat now toy boat now, now when you say it it sounds so easy but then when 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 i tried it, it's toy boat now there's there's something funny going on with toy, toy with your tongue your tongue is is curling there toy toy boat and then and then it goes flat toy boat toy yeah so it's getting that tongue uh, in shape to do those exercises, which they sound silly. And people say, oh, well, that's easy. You're listening, but just try it. I dare you. Go ahead. Try it, folks. Uh, <laughs> and do it when no one else is around you. <laughs> that's the key. That is the key. And you know what? I've been doing them for decades now. It's been 26 years since I started speaking. And that's what I was doing on the road. So toy, toy boat used to sound like toy boat because that's what the mouth tends to do if all those muscles aren't flexing. So it really goes down to, as you said, practice, practice, practice behind the scenes when nobody's watching. That's where the magic happens. Now, I now one of the lessons from music that occurs to me as, as an obvious, and you know, as soon as you say it's obvious, it's not. Uh, but one occurs to me is, is the use of the pause. You, you said it right, George. And you know what? That comes in during the rhythm section. There was a musician who said, the notes that I play are fine, but it's the spaces in between. Ah, that's where the magic happens. And with your, your pauses, you give a few things the chance to happen. One, if it's humor, you give your audience an opportunity to laugh. The comedians, you'll notice, when they tell a joke, they let the audience laugh. They leave it for a while instead of talking over the laughter. So you give the audience an opportunity to experience that joyful moment. 
if you ask a question where you want your audience to reflect and then stop speaking, it gives them an opportunity not to catch up to you, but actually to sit with that question and think about how it applies to them. So you have this opportunity to give them space. Also, for you as the presenter, you create intrigue. So if I were to tell you the one action that I've done that's made the biggest difference for my business, this is what it would be. Go ahead, John. You've got me in suspense here. <laughs> Don't make so, me so wait is, too long. <laughs> this is where you hold it. And you think about, you know, I think about Michael Jackson, one of my one of my favorite songs from him is She's Out of My Life. And he gets right down to the very end. And he said the chorus a few times. She's out of my life. She's out of my life. But the very last time he does it, she's out of my life. And then you hear the audience start to scream, we love you, Michael, we love you, Michael. And Michael won't sing the note. And then they stop saying, we love you, Michael. And they sing the damn note, Michael, sing it. <laughs> we wanna hear what comes next. We're so uncomfortable with the pause that as speakers, we tend not to incorporate it. So I encourage everyone, use that pause it, it there's power in it if we, we we use it to its maximum john from from the world of music what you've given us a, a few tips or practical tips already what what lesson do you think might surprise most people from music to speaking i would say that what we call the hook and we know in music that there is a hook. It's that one part of the song that we'll sing over and over again. And even if you're in a club dancing, so for example, uh, in The Lion Sleeps Tonight, there's that remove it, remove it, remove it. You know, everybody loves that part. When it comes on, they join in. Lady Marmalade, which is a song originally done by Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells. And there's that part of the song, even if you don't speak French, even if you don't know what it means, when it plays in the club, everyone's going, voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? Why? It's the hook. It catches the ear of the listener and we go back and now we start singing it to somebody else again. Oh yeah, there's this really cool part. In a speech, you can actually create hooks that, that you want your audience to go back and repeat over and over again. And the question is how? Well, you use different techniques that are what we would call rhetorical devices. When I speak about this presentation, for example, I say that a successful speech is one that your audiences will remember, repeat, and respond to. So what I'm using is alliteration because people automatically pick up on it. Oh, three R's, remember, repeat, respond. So alliteration, the repetition of consonant sounds at the beginning of a word. I also, in this situation, added what is called working or speaking in threes. So if you think about the rhythm that we, we listen to in speech, there is, I came or we came, we saw, we conquered, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, now abide, faith, hope, love. We listen and we speak in threes naturally. So remember, repeat, respond was a combination of both alliteration and speaking in threes. Well, that's one way that you can actually create a hook that people will walk away with. Also, you can do what Johnny Cochran did. The, you remember the OJ Simpson trial, how this trial went on for weeks, hours. Ah, you got it already. You can, you can still remember the vision. He said, if the glove doesn't fit. <laughs> you must acquit. <laughs> That's over 20 years ago. George, why do we still, oh gosh, it's nearly 30. We still remember it to this day. So rhymes are another way that we can create a hook when it's placed properly within your presentation. You know, there are a lot of different words for it or phrase, some people have called it a phrase that pays. But if you think musically, it's that hook and you can intentionally create them. Uh, we have them in, again, regular conversations, antithesis. 
Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. It's do or die. It's either here or there. So we speak in antithesis. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. This is placing two phrases opposite of one another. We tend to remember those as well. So these are all opportunities that you can create that one little phrase, sentence where someone says, I heard them speak years ago and I'll always remember when they said this. And you brought it up with, I have a dream. We still repeat it because there was emotion behind that phrase. But there was also emotion when George Bush Sr. said, read my lips. <laughs> no new taxes. <laughs> And we have got a hold of it. Why? Because there was emotion. So there are a number of different ways that you can take that hook that is so sexy in music and then translate it into your presentation as well. John, if people want to learn more about, about how you might help them, your programs, I believe you have a program called the High Stakes Performance Community. And, and if listeners or viewers want to find out more about that, what's in it for them? Why would they go there? Why would they participate? Well, George, what I've done is I, I understand this about a lot of people who are in groups like Toastmasters where you get to a certain point, and it's great because you go into Toastmasters to learn to speak. The question is, where do you go when you've learned to speak and you wanna learn what the professionals do who are now presenting at a, an exceptional level? Well, that's what this community is. So we have something as simple as a Tongue Twister Tuesday in which you would challenge every Tuesday to, to not only say the Tongue Twister, but to put it on video, put it in the community so you can have an accountability with your colleagues who are in that community to get better. We teach breathing techniques, but really it's a community of purpose-driven people who want to work together to improve their presentation skills so they can speak with more confidence, so they can attract their ideal clients when they speak, and so they, they can speak on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves. It's that next step of growth where they say, how do I get better? And it gives you the accountability and also the community in order to get it done. And I believe you have an offer to let people sample that program at, at no charge, no, no obligation. And in order to sample that, what do they need to do? All they have to do in order to sample it is to send an email to john at johnwatkiss.com and in the message, put your intended message community, your intended message community. Put that as the, as the, the subject and then your name and your phone number. I will have you set up for seven days, no charge, no strings attached. You don't have to join afterwards, but it will give you an opportunity to see what it's like to be around another group of people who want to get better so that they can have more impact and better results when they speak. And that information is in the description below. You can find the email and, and the information to contact John. Uh, John, in wrapping up, if there's one, two, or three pieces of advice you could, you could give to people, maybe even remind them on how they can make their presentation more musical, I'd say a couple things. As a reminder, remember that chorus. People have to know, George. They have to know why are they there listening to you. Always, always remember the importance of mood because mood is what makes the difference between just hearing and taking action after the speaking is done. That's where you get to the remember, repeat, and respond portion of the speech. Music makes us feel and so we respond by dancing. Our speech should also make us feel so we respond by taking action, whether that's donating or volunteering or signing up, whatever it is, that emotion is what makes a change. One point that I didn't make and I think is missed by many speakers, and it goes back to preparing for the ear that also comes from music, is simply the transition point or what we call a pre-chorus. Now, once we're finished singing the chorus, 
how do we get to the verse? There's got to be that little phrase or line. In music, it says, da, 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 da. So now we are preparing to move to the next section. We need to have those transitions, those pre-choruses in our speech as well. So we've just discussed. Next, here's what I want to talk about. Here's where we'll go next. And it's so simple. But if you don't do it, you've now been talking about one part, and then you go to the next part, and there's been no warning, no switch for the audience to know, hey, we're going somewhere else. In a book, it would be a paragraph. It would be another sentence. It would be a content heading. But in the speech, it's not there. So always remember your pre-chorus. Make sure your audience can follow you every step of the way through that song and knows when it's time to take a breather because either the chorus or the next verse is coming up. My guest today is John Watkiss, reminding you that it's not about attention. It's about getting interest. And remember the famous line from John, rubber baby buggy bumpers. Let's try that a couple <laughs> times, I dare you. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you convey your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.